Hey guys, what's up? So today we're going to take a look at the imaginary roots case for the constant coefficient homogeneous second order linear differential equation. And so this is the second case, I believe, that we've covered in this. Maybe, yeah, second, I think. So previously we looked at real roots. And that was just corresponding to the case where we have R1 and R2, which were real. Uh, so now we're going to look at the imaginary roots. Um, next time we're going to look at the uh, complex roots and then we're going to look at um, repeated roots. So these are the cases. Um, I decided to split up these cases. I mean technically both of these are complex imaginary numbers. Um, but first I want to show you in this video I want to show you the imaginary if we get pure imaginary roots and then after we are familiar with that and comfortable with that then we're going to move on to complex roots which are of the form a i plus b. So it's a little bit different, but it's not too bad. So anyway, let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, so let's take a look at this example right here. We have y double prime plus y is equal to zero. And since it is a constant coefficient homogeneous differential equation, we know that we need to assume y is of the form e to the r times t. And if we differentiate this twice, what we get is r squared times e to the rt. And let's go ahead and plug that back in and uh, factor out the e to the rt. So what we end up with is r squared plus 1 times e to the rt is equal to 0. We can go ahead and, and eliminate this guy right here because it, does not, uh, it doesn't ever equal 0. So we know if we can just cancel it out uh, by dividing both sides by it because we know that we won't be eliminating a root in doing so. So anyway, what we get is the characteristic equation r squared plus 1 is equal to 0. So let's go ahead and move the one to the other side. So r squared is equal to negative one. Take the square root, plus or minus the square root of negative one, or in other words, plus or minus i. So right here we have a purely imaginary root, uh, or two purely imaginary roots, plus i and minus i. So if we go ahead and plug that back into our solution that we assumed up here, uh, we get two, we get two uh, solutions. We get y1, which is equal to e to the i times t, and we get a y2, which is equal to e to the negative i times t. So instead of expressing our solution as uh, imaginary components, we want to express it as a real function. So what we want to do is we want to make use of Euler's formula, which says that e to the i times something, which we will call theta, has to equal cosine of that theta plus i times sine theta. So this is Euler's formula right here, um, and it can be derived using the Taylor series uh, expansion for uh, the exponential function, e to the x, and cosine and sine. Uh, if you guys want to see that, just let me know in the comments down below, and, and I can make a video for you. But anyway, for the purpose of this video, let's just go ahead and use this result to turn our two solutions into real components. So recall in a previous video, I said that any linear combination of two valid solutions is also going to be a valid solution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a new solution. I'll call YA. I'm going to define this as some scalar, we'll call C1, times Y1 plus Y2. And since this is just a scalar times a linear combination of the two valid solutions, we know that this YA is also going to be a valid solution. So this is okay. And then I'm going to define a YB equal to another constant times y1 minus y2. And again, using the same logic, we can uh, conclude that yb is also going to be a valid solution. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to rewrite these two formulas, these two solutions using Euler's formula. Um, so the way we do that is we look at the coefficient in front of the i. So in this case, it's just going to be this t right here. So I can rewrite this using Euler's formula. I can rewrite this as y1 is equal to cosine of t plus i times sine of t. And similarly, the coefficient in front of i on this, on this guy, y2, is actually going to be this, uh, this negative t, because we can rewrite this as i times a negative t. So y2 is going to be cosine of negative t plus i times sine of negative t. But I'm going to further simplify y2. Um, recall that cosine is an even function and sine is an odd function, so I can actually rewrite this as cosine of t minus i times sine 
of t. So using Euler's formula, I just rewrote y1 like this, and I rewrote y2 like this. So now let's come back down to our ya and yb. Um, I said that I wanted to express ya, our new solution, as c1 times y1 plus y2. So this is going to be equal to c1 times cosine t plus i times sine t, and then plus cosine of t, and then minus i sine t. Uh, and we can simplify this. This guy cancels with this guy, and we could add these two. So what we end up getting is c1 times 2 cosine t. Now, since we have a c1, which is a scalar times another scalar, I'm just going to absorb that 2 into the constant. So I'm just going to express it as c1 times cosine of t. And again, that's just because these both are scalars. c1 and 2 are scalars, so I can just absorb the 2 into the c1, and it, basically it's the same. Uh, so I'll just express it like this. And let's do the same thing with yb. Um, so what we get is c2 times y1 minus y2. So we get cosine t plus i sine t, and then minus cosine t plus i sine t, minus a minus is a plus. So this time, this cosine cancels with this cosine, and what I'm left with is c2 times 2i times sine t. So we're going to use the same idea here. We're going to absorb this 2i into the constant c2. It's perfectly okay that i is imaginary. So I'm just going to rewrite this as c2 times sine of t. So now hopefully you guys can see why I decided to define these new functions ya and yb to be our, uh, our real solutions. By choosing our ya to be the sum of y1 and y2, we were able to cancel out the imaginary parts. And similarly, by choosing another solution yb to be y1 minus y2, we were able to isolate the imaginary components and then absorb it into the constant. And by choosing these linear combinations, we also ensured linear independence, which is very important because we need two solutions in order to define the solution to, to this difference equation because we have two roots. So anyway, we'll take the first solution to be c1 cosine t, and we'll take the second solution to be c2 times sine t. So our final solution is just going to be linear combinations of our ya plus yb, which comes out to be c1 cosine t plus c2 times sine t. And this right here is our solution to this differential equation. So it's interesting how these trigonometric functions show up for a constant coefficient homogeneous second order differential equation. Uh, but if we actually look at the nature of this differential equation, we can kind of make sense of why that happens. We can make sense of why these cosine and sine functions pop up. And the reason is because what this differential equation is saying is that the second derivative of our function that we are looking for plus its zeroth derivative plus the function itself has to cancel out to zero. And cosine and sine are one of the few functions that have the properties that as you continuously take derivatives, they alternate sines and they alternate functions. So we get cosine, negative sine, negative cosine, sine, cosine, you know, and so on and so on. They just, they just alternate between cosine, sine, and they alternate sines. And that property, that property of, of their derivatives allow this function to satisfy this kind of differential equation. So it's actually not really a surprise that uh, these trigonometric identities come up in these cases. Now, in general, we can define the solution corresponding to pure imaginary roots. So, so let's say that we have r1 and r2 equal to plus or minus a times i. If we get pure imaginary roots like this, we can define a general form for a solution to be c1 cosine of a times t plus c2 sine of a times t, assuming that y is a function of t. So we can just go ahead and use this general form to solve pure imaginary roots uh, cases. Now, in the case of this different equation, in this example that we just solved, uh, our roots were plus or minus 1i. 1 times i. So again, if we just plug it into this formula, we get c1 cosine of 1 times t plus c2 sine of 1 times t, which is exactly what we ended up getting right here. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say about pure imaginary roots. In the next video, we're going to look at complex roots, where we have r1 and r2 equal to ai plus or minus b. So anyway, see you all in the next video, and thanks for watching.